Welcome, everybody. Um, one of the things we see on the streets is a lot of young people coming and protesting the inaction against climate change. We are perhaps making some progress, but not enough. Um, I've had the uh, pleasure to be able to edit a book of essays from climate activists, and one of the things that struck me is the diversity of stories that come through. And so I'd like to start with that for our panel today. Now, over the past two decades, at some point, you have realized the problem and you have become passionate about acting on it. So maybe we start with Leah. What was the moment that climate change became a concern for you, and then what did you do about it? Well, first, hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. My name is Leah Thomas. Um, I guess the moment I came to activism may have been when I was around three and my parents were taking me to protest and things like that. But honestly, I didn't really understand it or comprehend it until I was in college. And I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I lived about 10 minutes away from Ferguson, Missouri. And while I was studying environmental science and policy, I was on a summer break. And unfortunately, that is when the Ferguson uprisings began after the death of Michael Brown. Um, and when I went back to school to start studying environmental science and policy and really dig into the data, I was really distracted, rightfully so, with all the social injustice that was happening in my community. And I just started to think, what if my people had the right to breathe in every sense of the word? And not only that, what if my people had the right to experience joy? So social justice is such a big problem, but I found a solution within environmentalism. So that's what brought me to activism, kind of a roundabout way of social justice and figuring out there's so many links and connections between both social and environmental justice, and thinking that if everyone had the right to breathe, and drink clean water and just basic human rights, then maybe everyone could experience joy. So that was my moment. And Ricardo, you started with a thick book. Yes, so um, I come from the world's most climate vulnerable country. And I remember starting when I was nine years old. I didn't really knew what was happening back then, but I remember grabbing one of my father's book. He's over there, I, <laughs> right at the bottom. and. Um, I'm a very graphic person, so I remember seeing all the graphs, all the images, all the deforestation, and that just sticking in my head since I was so young. Fast forward over more than 10 years later, I started my- Al Gore's book, right? It's Al Gore's book. It's the An Inconvenient Truth. So this was around 2009, and that always stuck with me. And um, fast forward, I started my career as a sustainable development engineer, and that's where I realized that my country being outside of my country, that's where I actually realized that we, I lived and I was born in the most climate vulnerable country, Honduras. So um, that's when I decided to take action. That's when I decided to take matters onto my hand. That's when uh, I started promoting change within my community, within my family. Now my father also works in climate change, which is something that is really uh, always inspiring to me. But not only him, but we created a community of more than 500 young leaders who are actively engaged in making conscience about what climate change is in Honduras. And so your, your father was involved in environmental activities before, but now he specifically works on climate change because you got into the field, is that right? Yes, that's just how it was. And um, a lot of what we know in Honduras is perhaps related. We know about floods, we know about hurricanes, we know about droughts, but we don't know what's actually causing it, who is actually causing it, and I believe this is very important to be talked, not only in my country, but in all the global south and the most vulnerable countries as well. And Teresa, your experience is a little bit different. It was, uh, there was a moment you could crystallize uh, in, a, in a weather event. Yeah, so hi everyone again, my name is Teresa. So for me, how my work as a climate justice activist really started was that when I went home to India in 2018. So I'm originally from Kerala, uh, which is a state in the southern part of India, but I live in Ireland. We went home in 2018 for a cousin's wedding and the rains that arrived that monsoon were not expected. They were torrential, they were extreme, and they ended up flooding towns, submerging towns, washing away livelihoods. But just how quickly it happened and how torrential and unexpected those rains were, it was sort of like an eye-opener for me. I was 14 at the time and I had just come home to you know, celebrate with my family, but 
what I saw when I woke up the next morning were tree, trun tree trunks submerged, news showing houses submerged, and just sort of how cities that once had people full of it was just full of water. And I think for me, that specific moment was when I came home to Ireland afterwards, and there was radio silence na nationwide, internationally. India had lost 400 lives during that one flood, um, which happened throughout the span of about two to, th two to three days. Um, and there was just radio silence. And what was being actually covered at the time was Donald Trump's golf trips. And that really frustrated me. I wanted to know more about why this was happening. And when I educated myself, I knew that this is climate change and these floods that completely tormented my state will continue to happen again. So it was that specific moment. And it's, you know, the education system is getting better at being able to include climate change in curricula around the world, but you had to go an extra step. It wasn't available to you right in school. It isn't. What we learn about the climate change is just simply the geography or just simply the science. We don't learn about climate justice. We don't learn about the stories and the actual impacts of it. So but before the, um, the torrential floods that even occurred, I knew that, yes, greenhouse gases. I knew about the ozone layer. I knew that it was depleting. But what I didn't know was that how fossil fuels are contributing to this problem, how climate justice means putting people and the land in front of our decision making. So that information isn't available. I had to go and find it myself. And as I learned more, I became more and more traumatized at the idea that Kerala isn't the only place and it won't be the only place left. Now, the other thing uh, that I think is missed in the conversation is a lot of young people show up on the streets and are protesting, and that's the most visual impact that people have either in, in headlines or if they are on the street, they observe it. But you are acting on climate change outside of protests, and so maybe, maybe we can start with that, Leah. What is it that you do when you're not protesting to move the ball on acting on climate change? That's a great question, and I think when I was studying environmental science and I would go home and try to lecture my family and friends about why they needed to solve the climate crisis, I was losing a lot of people, I was being really preachy, and I was using a lot of inaccessible language. And then I started to think about what I call eco-communications because I love writing and I love communications and thinking about how can I communicate climate justice information in a way that is not rooted in shame, is exciting, and is also accessible for the everyday person. Because there's no reason that this information should be gatekept at academic institutions. If we want everyone to be stewards for the planet and to take action, we should show them all the ways that they can and produce this information as accessibly as possible. So that's what gave me the idea to start utilizing social media and creating infographics and things like that, really leaning into the social media channels that a lot of the youth are already using, like TikTok and Instagram, and finding ways to get really well-researched information to the youth. So that's why I believe eco-communications is really important, and we're seeing a lot of people turn to social media, and that's their first step into the world of activism and environmental advocacy. So big proponent of social media and TikTok dances. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ricardo, you've uh, turned not just being part of protests, but you now actually work on strategies to decarbonize your country. You know, what is it that you had to first convince somebody in Honduras to take it seriously? And how, I mean, in a way, you created that job for yourself, right? Yes, so I'm a, I'm a 23 year old policymaker. I'm currently working on my country's national decarbonization strategy. I'm doing it because we need people to actually put this type of thought into transforming our country. So for me, it's not only about addressing our mere 0.03 emissions that we contribute to climate change but it's about how we can lift people out of poverty, how we can actually transform our society into a more equitable, a more sustainable, and a more competitive society against the world. So in a sense, I had to create this job for myself. There are definitely not many job positions for 23-year-olds on, <laughs> on policy making. And, um, but it's a lot about having to put this uh, idea that young people are more than just the ones that are you know, holding up their sign, that are participating in protests. And that was very clear to me when I got to engage with young researchers, with young artists, with young policy makers like myself, with young uh, directors of NGOs, and so many much work that I think that 
youth were being undervalued, where sometimes we're being invited to, to a picture, sometimes we're invited to a consultation, but I'm not really into consultations. I'm not really into, you know, just having my, just a couple of uh, thoughts written down or anything. We're actually here to make real progress, and I think that's, that's one of my biggest messages here today, that we need to value youth as we are. We are not only the future, we're the present. And Teresa, one other thing I think is lost is that the protest is sort of the creamy layer on top. A lot happens underneath to make you know, a spectacle, but also to be able to get your voice heard um, in a mass, uh, you know, a mass of people. What does organizing look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, because you're, you've been involved in many of these um, organizations across, you know, protests in um, Ireland, but also here. Mm -hmm. So I've been organizing for the last three and a half years, both on a local, national, and international level. And the first thing I can tell you is it's tiring. It really is. Like even today itself, I've been organizing here at COP26 and running across the city. Um, it just really comes to show that the youth are quite capable of organizing protests, of getting their seats on decision-making tables and engaging with stakeholders. So for me, what a normal day of organizing would look like is morning looking through emails, then hopping onto calls, brainstorming what's the next big thing, how can we make sure that young people are not just given a seat at the table for a dinner, but we're given a permanent table at this decision-making process where we can continue to give in our input. And then, you know, more meetings with stakeholders, calling up local politicians, asking them, when can you come and listen to us? When can you come and give us, you know, your input and thoughts? And then it comes back again to just connecting with the community, because this is a tiring work. I, I balance my classes, I balance my personal life alongside this. And it just comes back to connecting with my community, briefing on what has happened, what can we do better, and just sort of allowing myself to relax the very few hours of relaxation I get. But um, it's tiring, but it's worth it at the end. Now, there was a moment, and it's just a coincidence that all four of us were there together in Edinburgh, uh, where uh, two weeks ago there was a summit organized by TED. Um, and it was a panel where we had uh, the CEO of Shell uh, on the stage. We had uh, the head of Engine Number no. One, which is the activist hedge fund that got three new board members on ExxonMobil's board. Um, and we had a, a young activist named Lauren who was on the panel. And what happened on that stage, which I'll describe briefly, sparked a lot of conversations. That the rest of the day, all I could hear were people trying to decide whether what Lauren did next was the right thing or not. And what Lauren did is essentially after uh, Ben Van Buden had his moment to speak, um, Lauren got up and said, I can't share the stage with you because I do not believe that what you're doing is good for the planet. And then she walked off. Now, you saw that moment, and I've not asked each of you this reaction before, so, so tell me what you thought, whether what she did was a good thing, or should she have stayed on the stage for the rest of the hour to have made her voice heard? Do you understand? It's a very complicated question, and I really hope people realize there was a lot of action, especially of BIPOC youth, that allowed for that moment to happen. There are three meetings that I went to and countless phone calls with different activists from around the world trying to figure out what we should do. And one of the um, questions or demands to organizers was, could we please have an activist who's familiar with this area that we're in to take the stage? And they agreed pretty reluctantly. We also asked if that activist could be a person of color. But you know, she did a great job. We get a couple things done, and that's OK. Um, but I don't like the rhetoric that people are saying that we have to, we should be thankful to share the stage and be in conversation with industries that are ruining our planet and our communities especially when you're talking to people of color or people who are living with the impacts of what um, the oil and gas industry can do, that we should be thankful to have a seat at the table and that we should be there to beg them on stage to listen to us. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And Theresa, alongside your reaction, just give us a little bit of background as to what happened 
for that panel to have happened in the first place mm -hmm. because we knew that the CEO of Shell was invited, but the panel, the format of the panel changed, the composition of the panel changed, and, and there was a backstory to that. Yes, so um, I was one of the organizers of this protest, and I think it needs to be stated as well. This panel was not supposed to be a panel. It was an opportunity for the, Shell of, the CEO of Shell to spew his greenwashing and spew his tactics to continue to push um, fossil fuels at the head of his agenda. But we had requested, we engaged in countless meetings. I've been on meetings while waiting in the airport um, to try and convince Ted to allow us to put an activist on that panel. Because when we give people like this platforms without anyone to rebuke it or rebuke it, we're allowing them to just pass whatever they want to, whatever they want to say to be the truth. So after we had finally gotten Lauren onto that panel, we had countless meetings discussing how do we pitch this, how do we organize this, what exactly do we say? Because every second counts, and every word that Lauren said had to hit home. And I'd like to say Lauren did great well, um, quite well in that as well. My reaction to it, I thought it was necessary. I, I still remember, um, we, I was one of the banner holders, so as soon as Lauren started to drink off her mic, we stood up, took our banners, and came to the front, <coughs> and the entire first row started booing at us. I could see their reactions going, ah, no, let him speak. But how do we let a man speak who leads the company that has caused murders, that has led tortures, that has completely polluted our world and caused trauma to hundreds and thousands of people across the world? How do we continue to listen to a man whose company is the reason why places all across the world are flooded, are in drought, and how people like myself, Lee and Ricardo, are doubtful of having a future at all? So I'd like to say I was quite proud of that. Now, you know, many of us, I grew up in India, um, and in developing countries require fossil fuels, Honduras requires fossil fuels. When you're thinking about this, and you should give me the reaction you had to the panel, but when you're thinking about this, fossil fuels are necessary for your country too, and you're thinking about it from a decarbonization strategy. Mm. How do you pair, as a young person who's seen this debate play out, the, the need for fossil fuels while having to move away from them? So um, I know it's hard to actually picture what um, climate change really is. I know sometimes we just imagine it as the flood once every once in, in a while, you know, and then the, the hurricane every now and then. But I, I really do come from a country which after a few hurricanes has just had decades of, after being one of the safest countries in the world, one of the most violent countries, a lot because of the poverty, a lot of migration, a lot of issues that really transform your country entirely. And um, so for me to be sitting there and just hearing to the, the CEO of Shell, I completely agree with my colleagues, and it was just a, a slap in the face, you know, because uh, 2050, for me, I know 2050 sounds so long, it's uh, long-term strategies, whatever. I feel like I'm gonna be a lot younger than many of the people that are gonna be here in 2050. <laughs> I don't wanna be mean, I don't wanna be mean, but uh, that's the case for us. That's the case for youth, you know? So in a sense, um, we do need to do this urgently. This is no joking matter. This is really nothing to be, you know, in a sense, just taking lightly, especially for countries like us. And in the end, we do represent the majority of the world's population. So I really believe that I can only imagine how much he must earn, you know, just to be there and keeping up his face and trying to actually, you know, make it all, all like he's actually doing some good job. He really isn't. And the CEO of Shell is just one of many people who are actually, you know, just playing around with the future, just toying around with us, like if we were worthless or if we were really not valuable human beings. So it was a slap in the face just to sum it up in general. Right, now, um, one thing I would say, the panel is unedited and available on Ted's website, so I would urge you to go and see it. It's an hour long, but uh, both what happened and the discussion that followed was, uh, was very interesting. Now, each of you have come across what you do in different routes and you pursue different pathways. What's been the hardest thing to, apart from being A, treated as a young person, which is, is a problem, but beyond that, what has been the hardest part of your journey, both in acting on climate change through your role and through, through your activism? You know, so. so definitely, um, I've been having such a hard time on people actually picturing that on what climate change really is, you know, and uh, just to give a very, um, perhaps a very straightforward example is that just the past year, 
we had already endured a very tough pandemic, which had already um, dropped our, our gross national product over negative 7%. And then we had two maximum category five hurricanes in a span of two weeks. So this was just one after the other, which dropped our GDP up to negative 11%. What would that mean to the United States? What would that mean to Europe? I know that's even unfathomable, it's unpicturable. So, but that's the reality. That's the reality of the developing countries. That's the realities of all of us who are living below the equator line and all of us who are living in the tropics. So, I really think that a lot of people here are business leaders, a lot of people here are influential. I just want you to think about what's your, what's your footprint gonna be? Is it gonna be one of the more carbon footprints that we've been having so much for so long times? Or are we actually gonna have a real positive social footprint that is actually going to contribute and that is actually going to mark a change for the upcoming generations. I think for me something that I found the hardest um, is to actually convince people that climate justice is something to do because it is right. Not just because it puts money in your pocket and not just because it gives you good PR. Because for a lot of us from the Global South, who are a family in the Global South, acting on the climate is not just something to look forward to in the future, it's something to ensure the livelihoods of our families, to ensure the fact that my country will continue to be a country, that my state will continue to be a state, and that my home will continue to be a home. But I've, in, in this sphere, engaging with stakeholders, I've met a lot of individuals who have sort of been like, oh yes, climate action is, is money making, climate action is good because I can make finance out of it. Yes, that is a side thing. But the most important thing, and the thing that should be guiding each and every one of our works in ensuring a climate um, sustainable and friendly world is the fact that it is right. It is right to protect our futures, it is right to protect people, and it is right to always put people over profit. So that's definitely been my hardest thing. Just before I come to Leah, one follow-up. You know, you've been, you've also, you know, you travel to India every year, but climate as a topic doesn't show up as often in the news, isn't there in the conversation. How have you tried to push, you know, awareness of climate change in India, and, and what kind of struggle has that uh, led to? So a lot of the information about climate change in India, again, is very much jargon. Even I sometimes struggle to understand it. And technically, the government is legally obliged to pro provide any information regarding sort of you know, new um, documents in the 22 languages of India, but a lot of the times they don't. So a lot of the people on the ground, the frontline communities, the indigenous communities, the, the towns and the villages, they don't know why this is happening or how, is, how it is happening. They are not, they're not provided the information to do so. So a lot of the work that I do is talking to the people, making them understand through accessible information, why is this happening, how is this happening? Because once the people unite and they organize, they're putting pressure on the government so the government cannot quite literally ignore. So because of that lack of information, that, that sort of deliberate attempt by the government to not provide that information is one of the reasons why India um, is not exactly leading in climate action. Yeah. I think something that's been really difficult is advocating for funding and resources for environmental justice based work. I've been looking into the environmental justice funders pledge that I all recommend you all check out, but 50% of philanthropic funds um, goes to 12 large white male led environmental organizations and less than 2% of philanthropic funds goes to BIPOC led environmental justice organizations and BIPOC stands for black, indigenous and people of color. So we are working with less than 1% of all of the funding that goes to environmental work to advocate for the survival of our people and the planet at the same time. And I believe that people of color are the bearers of our own solutions and should have the resources to do the work that we need to do. So that's been really difficult advocating for that, but I hope with the Environmental Justice Funders Pledge and other initiatives, we can kind of close that funding gap so we can do this urgent climate justice work. Well, you didn't bring up the fact that you have a book coming. It's called The Intersectional Environment List, so <laughs> it'll be out next year, and, and I hope you guys uh, get it and, and read about it. But thank you so much for your thoughts. This has been fantastic. <laughs>